Katya, and thank you everybody uh, who is here with us. Um, I'm happy to present a few uh, things we did in the past on nuclear. Um, but before doing this, and, and maybe even before I start, I have to say, um, you have met, and also in the audience, there are many expert on, experts on nuclear. I'm not really one of them. So for me, this study I'm going to present, that was the first study, I mean, you know, studying energy and energy transitions, you, I mean, you always come across nuclear, but I'm by no means a nuclear expert. Luckily, in our team, we also had people who were more knowledgeable about nuclear, but just saying, you know, also for me, it, or in this study, it was the first time to really look into what's going on in nuclear. So um, just this as a background. Um, but before I go into this, um, uh, I would like to, um, or I, I mean, and that might also be the case that you discuss these things before, but I would like you to give a bit more of the uh, bigger picture um, on what some in research and also increasingly in policy call sustainability transitions. So the general and the more uh, overarching changes that go on in energy and also in other sectors. That is one issue I will talk about. And then I will go into the study we did on nuclear and at the global level. And of course, the I will then wrap up with the, I mean, this is the, um, we already saw that in the discussion, the underlying issue is of course, what do we do about climate change is, and is nuclear a solution here or not? And just what I'm saying here, my current take is it's not very likely that nuclear will be a solution here for climate change. But let's first go into this bigger picture of sustainability transitions. Um, so it is clear from many of the things we see that we are living in very difficult times and we are confronted with a lot of major and very fundamental sustainability issues. Many of these are related to energy and the energy use, but of course there are many other problems. And for example, the sustainability development goals, um, they capture the, the variety of issues we have to be dealing with. And the, why I'm showing this, and you might say, yeah, well, we have seen these things before, um, but the underlying message here is that in order to deal with the magnitude of things we are confronted with, um, we need to change the systems we use to consume and produce things in a very fundamental way. And that's, that's what this research and policy making about sustainability transitions is about. So we need fundamental changes in, for example, energy, transport, agriculture, and many other sectors in order to confront these fundamental uh, grand challenges in terms of sustainability. So the, 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 the bottom line here is, I mean, we can talk all the, I mean, and we have to talk about all these kinds of low carbon innovations I mean, and, and the things that are currently going on driven by, uh, by, by wind and solar, driven by electric vehicles, in every food, we see a lot of things happening. I mean, there's a lot of talk um, about difficult to decarbonize energies with hydrogen and synthetic fuels. Think of aviation, think of shipping. But the thing is, I mean, we need these fundamental changes also in the way, not just developing new technologies, but also in the way how we use energy and how we consume things. So that's that's one of the issues and that that in the end then goes back to the, our lifestyles and our what, what what we think is what we can consume and what we think uh, we deserve and um, that that is a or the needs we have and that's a bigger discussion we cannot talk about today but this is also behind these large scale transformations um, just one thing here is saying these sustainability transitions, they have a strong tech component. So it's also about technological change and they have happened in the past. And this is just a well-known example from automobility. And the takeaway message here is 
there are not just the changes in the core technology when you look at these things, um, but it also goes along with changes in infrastructures like here, the road infrastructure for cars, but also when you look at the bigger picture and in research, we use the, the term of the social technical system, which means um, there is a technology, but there are also many other factors that are subsumed under the social term that play a role um, when we look at how innovations develop. And these other factors, they include of course, finances, they include politics, they include infrastructures, what I have already mentioned. Uh, they include industries that can build here the cars or nuclear reactors, they include maintenance, they include markets, they include users, they include lifestyles. So these things all go together. And when we are talking about changing systems, whether these are about energy or transport or agri-food, but we're talking about system changes. We are talking about changes in all these different kinds of dimensions. And they may be technical at first, but then soon, I mean, you see it with electric vehicles, then there is a lot of discussion about the infrastructure, about charging, also about changing regulations, about the subsidies, about policies that can support the transition and so on. So we have to always look at this bigger picture. Now back to energy, and we're getting to nuclear in a second. Um, we already had the discussion um, about what is happening in Germany. And the nice thing is that the German example is also can also be used to explain how these transitions unfold or what happens in the case of a transition. So here you see the 1990s, um, Germany and German electricity production you see nuclear in red, you see co uh, hard coal in, in black and lignite in brown. Um, this is a situation where these were the main energy carriers for power production and a situation in which these were very stable. And you here see uh, natural gas and hydropower and the new renewables, there was not much happening back then. So that's what in transition terms we call the pre-development phase. You have a very stable system and no major changes going on. Then in the 2000s, you see this, this, these established technologies are still pretty much stable. We call this the regime technologies. Um, so they are not changing much in the second phase, in the takeoff phase. But we see here, especially with the uh, renewables, that something is happening. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm leaving out the gas thing. I mean, that's um, associated with the, um, the market liberalization. That has also changed the system, no question. Um, but just for explaining this battle between the new things and the established things, you see here new things arising. And then comes the phase of what we call acceleration is when it gets really messy. And there you see two things happening. First, on the innovation side, you see um, that renewables or the diffusion of renewables in the, in the case of Germany picked up quickly, but you also, I mean, there are also things happening. For example, biomass here slowed down while wind still increased. Um, and at the same time, you see technologies in decline. The nuclear decline starting here is the most uh, pervasive so far, but we also see the decline in hard coal. And last year, as Phil already mentioned, uh, the decline in lignite. So, um, and, and this, is, this is where the situation is at. Um, I'm not saying, so, and this is the acceleration phase. So we, we, are, we don't know what's happening in this latest phase when it, you know, when the transition perhaps comes to, you know, to some kind of stable phase again. We cannot say, I mean, there are also debates about what happens to wind, what happens to solar, can they still continue the rapid diffusion? So this is something we don't know. And maybe that's also one of the uh, things to always have in mind. We don't know about the future. We have some experiences with past transitions. We have some knowledge about what 
has happened, what typically happens, but whether this then happens in each specific country and case, that is something we don't know. So we don't know whether the German energy transition or transition to renewables will unfold as we, or as some expect that we see in, I don't know, 10, 20 years time, a system that is primarily based on, renew and on renewable energies. We don't know that, but at the moment, um, we see that this transition has taken off in that direction. Okay, uh, just to wrap this up, um, sustainability transitions are complex. There is an interplay of many different technologies and there are these different phases of transitions and there are changes in different dimensions. We now here have primarily looked at changes in technology, but as I already said, they are accompanied by changes in policy, in markets, in businesses, and also on the consumer side. And importantly, transitions include innovation, here depicted by the things that go up, and they also include decline. And so when we, so in, in, in transition studies, we have primarily studied innovation because that's, you know, that these are the new things, these are the interesting things, um, or, you know, at least for innovation researchers, this is where you want to understand what's going on, who is driving, let's say, electric mobility or hydrogen. I mean, this is where the new business is, and that's, this is where the money goes, and that's, that's very interesting. Um, but then again, of course, there are also these processes of decline and there is resistance of incumbent industries associated with decline. And, but like from, from, a, from a research uh, perspective, not so many people have yet looked into decline and this is something we wanted to change. And um, this is also why we said, hey, let's look into nuclear. That might be an interesting case to study an industry that has been long there and the, its future prospects. But again, before going into this, I have, give, have to give you one more insight into um, the, the framework we used. Um, so for our study on nuclear, we used what we call the technological innovation systems perspective. So it's essentially a framework that uh, acknowledges that there are many components in a system, both technological, but also organizational, political, institutional, and so on, and that these always you know, interact with each other and they all play a role when new things develop or when existing things decline. And the overall idea when using the framework is to explain why a technology or a larger industry performs well or has problems or does not perform so well. And for these kinds of studies, we use different analytical dimensions. As I said before, we look at actors, also we look at firms, we look at policies, institutional conditions, we look at innovation networks, and we also look at the contexts in which an industry or a technology is placed. And um, we have then typically this focal innovation system, let's say here about nuclear, and then you have these wider context issues like climate change, like uh, electricity market liberalization. You have competing innovation systems like coal or renewables. You have complementary innovations. You have other sectors like the military that comes in and supports this focal technology. And so you have, you know, it's not an isolated thing, but you, it's, it's all um, embedded in a, in a broader context. That's the message here. So what we did was uh, a case study on nuclear. And in this case study, I was supported by three colleagues from uh, different universities. And what we wanted to look at, and the question we asked uh, for the study is whether this nuclear innovation system is at the global level in a phase of decline or not. And um, what we did, we looked at the construction industry, so the design and construction of nuclear reactors. So not so much at, at the suppliers of nuclear energy, because the reason for doing this is that we said, okay, in the construction industry, because we have this long lifetimes of nuclear reactors and in the construction industry, we see 
um, things happening before we see them in supply. And we also focused on large reactors. So our study did not include small uh, modular reactors. The scope was global. We looked at the entire history of nuclear and we went out and tried to assemble as many data and indicators as we could. And um, that was not an easy task because of the global scale and, and some data was easily available and others took us a little more to acquire. Um, but yeah, that's, I, yeah, I think we, we, we got together a few interesting things and I will walk you through this in the next minutes. Um, just before I start uh, to say, we were not, I mean, this study we did last year, but we were not the first ones to ask whether nuclear is in decline or not. So for example, there is a, there is a book uh, from the 1980s about the US nuclear industry. And already back then the question came up, well, what is happening to nuclear? Is this still a healthy industry? But let's look at the data as they are today. And I think you might have seen many of these things during the last days. So um, I just show you what a few things of what we did. And um, then we can also, if we need more time, come back to this in the discussion. Um, so this is the global diffusion of nuclear is, I mean, we see the, the heydays of nuclear in the 70s and 80s with a lot of reactors under construction. And we see the um, more recent um, wave of new builds, especially led by China. And here in black, we see the overall uh, diffusion curve, curve, if you like. Um, then looking at generation, um, we see in blue the overall uh, power generation by nuclear per year. And the red line is the share of nuclear in global electricity production. You're probably very familiar with these curves. Then what we did is, I told you before about these different dimensions. We, for example, looked at actors and uh, also as I said, we are focusing on the construction, nuclear construction industry. We looked at the big firms that build nuclear and who did this at what point in time. And here we see generation capacity under construction. Again, we see the two waves uh, we already saw in the diffusion curve. Um, and what we also see here is how the share of new builds by each firm changed over time. Um, for example, the Westinghouse, which was holding a big share of the market um, that uh, went out sometime around here. And we see that also for the other firms. And um, we see, for example, Rosatom that has a pretty stable um, business. And we see others going down as well. And here we listed which firms uh, exited the market at some point. So, for example, Siemens uh, gave up in 2001. Uh, Westinghouse was bought by Toshiba and the other, you know, uh, sa sales and mergers of the big nuclear players um, that have happened. So what we see here is um, an industry that saw a big collapse in the 1990s had some kind of revival, but that also lost many of its key players. A second picture, and I can, don't expect you to, to, to see the details here. Um, if you look at the paper, and I think Katya shared the paper, you can zoom into these graphs and you see all the details in all of these periods. So what we did here is that we, again, that was reactor construction and uh, we looked at the owners, so those who ordered nuclear power plants and were operating them, and those who built them. So, and each, each tie you see between two nodes is between a firm that built the nuclear power plant and between one that bought or later operated the nuclear power plant. 
And these ties only occur while the nuclear reactor is constructed. So again, as I said, we look into the construction industry and how this industry developed or the network of these players develop over time. And what you see here is that through the 70s, 80s and 90s, a very dense network of very many industry uh, ties built up. But then later, the last 10, 20 years, we see a more scattered landscape of more isolated actors. Um, and it has not entirely dried out. So this is a projection of, of future so far as we know it. Um, but it has become much, it has built up density and it has lost its density again. So. It's not easy to interpret this, um, but one of the uh, indications is that with this loss of density in the recent decades, there is also a risk that uh, knowledge that has been accumulated in this industry is not as easily available or as easily can not as easily be transferred from one firm or from one country to another. Um, so that is a bit of an insight into the, you know, the health and the connection of the industrial knowledge base, if you will. Another thing we looked at in our study is what uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency projects for the future of nuclear. So as you all know, this is one of the proponents of nuclear energy and in their high scenario. So that is their most optimistic scenario for the future of nuclear. And our interest was not so much in what these numbers are and how high they are, but our interest was in whether we see changes in these projections for the future. And these are the 2020 and 2030 projections. And of course, they're also projections for 2040 and 50. But what we see here that the general trend is going down. So even the most optimistic scenarios of proponents of nuclear, they do not show very health, healthy signs of a potential future development of the industry. In a final step, we looked at Everything, you, you remember this, this picture I showed you before with the different elements um, and boxes, we looked at what is happening in the context of nuclear. So I have already mentioned there was electricity market liberalization that was, uh, that did change the market structures essentially in many uh, countries around the world and that created the some of the problems around nuclear, especially with independent power producers coming up. There were always competing technologies, natural gas, coal, renewables. Of course, the climate change debate, geopolitics and the military, what Phil was already uh, showing us. And here I ju just show, so there are more details in the paper here. I just show one picture. Um, I'm not sure whether you have discussed it in the, over the last days. This is, um, the, these are the latest figures on, on costs for renewables and what is from a nuclear and fossil fuel perspective, what is really worrying is um, that for, especially for solar photovoltaic and onshore wind um, that these, and, and here I hope you can see this, this, these gray shaded areas, these are the cost range. So it's always cost ranges, of course, and these are utility scale projects. So, and, and the, you know, the lines are the average or the median costs, I think, um, of these projects. And um, of course you see the cost regression, that is something what we would expect, but the, the takeaway take away message here is that solar photovoltaics and onshore wind, they're already below the lowest fossil and nuclear alternatives. And that's for the incumbents in the industry, that's the worrying message. I mean, of course, 
these costs differ from where you go and from the local resource conditions. There is no question about these things. But um, the thing is that also the, the projection of these costs are in a way that these are not is not the end of the um, of the technological progress. And this is this is also what we said in our study. This is one of the main threats and complications for nuclear that the competing um, low carbon alternatives have developed so rapidly and have decreased their costs in a way that it is very difficult for other technologies, and especially for nuclear, to catch up and to compete again on, a, on, a, on an economics basis. So to conclude, um, we did, so, and this is, you know, this was more, so this is not hard science, but more of a, you know, a traffic light chart exercise to try to make a complex message simple. We compared the 1970s, so the, the, the high times of nuclear and the today, and we said, okay, after having looked into all of these different dimensions, what is our rough assessment at a global scale, how nuclear is performing? And you see that many of the things that have been looking pretty good um, have changed to, you know, to, to states of, yeah, well, it's not looking as good anymore, or there are major concerns, or it's really looking bad in, in, in red. So this is, um, that's, how we try to capture the different indicators in, in, in one chart. To summarize, um, the question was, is nuclear in a decline or not? Um, our answer was rather yes. We see many indicators that point to a decline of nuclear. Of course, we don't know whether nuclear will decline in the future, but at the moment there is not much reason, or I mean, there are many, as I said, there are many indications that we will see a further decline of nuclear. And particularly worrying, in, in my opinion, is that the industry base with these networks I showed you has, has weakened and we have much less um, capable uh, nuclear power suppliers than we had 20, 30 years back. Um, that's one of the issues. Of course, there are also positive developments. Um, the new constructions, especially in China, and also the hopes around SMRs, that these, these point to, especially these, okay, there might be innovation happening. You, you, you might be familiar with what has been called in the past the sailing ship effect. If, if, if an incumbent technology comes under pressure, um, it starts again to innovate and the SMRs are one such indicator that there is innovation going on, that the industry faces a lot of pressure and there is innovation going on and that might, there might come something out of it. We don't know that. Um, but the main challenge, as I said, for nuclear are the cheap renewables and which brought us to the conclusion that in liberalized markets, there is, there will be rather no nuclear no new nuclear without subsidies. So that's, it's, it's very difficult to imagine how that can happen. And to conclude at the bigger picture, um, as I said before, we see very fundamental transformation happening in energy. They, these are mostly di driven by climate, climate change, but also in related sectors happening. And these are very fundamental and nuclear is just one element in the puzzle. It's an important element, and but you know the level of changes in what's going on is much bigger than just the discussion on nuclear. And one of the issues what we what we will see in the future is all these are all these debates about sector coupling. So with nuclear, we primarily talk about electricity, perhaps heat, but there is also I mean the the electrification of transport, the electrification of industry. What we are seeing. Um, so there is something happening that also we might see much stronger couplings between sectors that have so far not been linked or coupled as closely as before. 
plus, of course, and that also goes back then to, I mean, that connects electricity and smart grids, but especially transport, electric vehicles, demand side management, we, we see the digitalization coming in. And it has been discussed as a game changer for energy for a long time and has so far not materialized in a way that it has completely transformed the industry. But nonetheless, this will not go away. And we can imagine futures where we have electric vehicles that are, you know, as soon as they are connected with a grid through the charger that can be used as backup power um, to store electricity for the short term when demand is low and production is high. And the same things can be, I mean, are happening on more regular demand on stationary, stationary demand. So we can imagine much more intelligent electricity systems than those we see today. Of course, climate is a game changer in all of this and a strong driver for low carbon technologies. Um, and coming back to the question of this conference, whether nuclear is a solution for climate, um, my take on it, the chances, chances are not very high. We see high risks, especially to the uh, long times to build nuclear and also the long spans to operate nuclear, especially in liberalized markets. We don't know what electricity prices of the future will be. So it's, there are high risks. The costs are high. Nuclear new build is slow. And for climate change, it might come to late. So this is, yeah, these are the takeaways from nuclear. Not, not a rosy picture, um, but this is what, I guess, what's on the table. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and happy to discuss. Thank you. Further. Thank yeah. you, Ben. Um, yes, we'll go into uh, a discussion. Um, maybe a thought before, yeah, you were, um, as you were, or in the last slide, we see written energy and other sectors, early stages of fundamental transformations that we're seeing. Yeah, and when I was looking at the graphs of, um, I think it was on the example of Germany still. Uh, but yeah, um, if we would take uh, an example of Slovenia, I don't see uh, any signs of even early stages of any kind of, let's say, fundamental transformation when it comes to uh, also the, if we just uh, focus on the energy sector, um, taking into account that uh, if we've been reliant for our uh, production of electricity on coal, hydro, and nuclear in the past decades, uh, there are currently really no signs of any fundamental changes uh, happening uh, in that sense. Um, and what we're um, sort of the plans and the messages that are coming uh, from the policymakers, whether it's environmental ministers or on the governmental level as a whole, uh, we still have a, a push for, yes, um, new hydro uh, power and then this idea of a new nuclear reactor. So mm -hmm. when it comes to this sustainability transitions, uh, Slovenia is currently, I don't think if it's experiencing uh, any stages or any early steps into a sustainability trend uh, in this, ki this kind of transition when it comes to the energy sector. Um, taking into account that also in the past 10 years, uh, we haven't, I think we've, our share of renewables went up by 2% um, and we plan to um, increase our share of renewables in the next decade for another, I think, 2%. So maybe that's just when it comes to transformations taking place or not taking uh -huh. place, a realistic picture in Slovenia is like, yeah, we don't have, let's say, curves that would be approaching each other, such as in the graphs. Uh, shown in your presentation, but okay. Um, we maybe are maybe, not... maybe to, to just to react to that, um, it might not look as encouraging in every place as it is at the global scale. But I mean, these things are out there. The renewables become cheaper every day and as we speak. Um, and, you know, of course you can, and, and, and like nuclear, every country is also surrounded by what is happening in its context. And of course you can maintain or try to maintain the structures within your country for 
quite a while. And especially in energy, we have long lasting infrastructures. You, you can kind of shield your market or, you know, you know, you, you can remain in a phase where you still think nothing much is happening, but the changes are happening around you. And as you cannot, you know, no industry was able to, 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 to block the wave of digitalization. Sooner or later, it came to every industry. And in the same way, I imagine that the changes that we see in new renewable energies, they sooner or later will come to every country. It's, I mean, it can be frustrating when you're sitting in a, when you, when you are in a country where it's not yet happening. And also, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there are no conflicts about new renewables. There are a lot of conflicts around that, right? It's not just, it's not, we replace one technology with some other technology that has no problems. I mean, there's, there will always be issues with what we do. Um, but as I said, once you have these waves of change happening at a global scale, there is hardly anything you can do to prevent it from diffusing um, to every place. Maybe that's <laughs> just as a positive note. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, yes, uh, we've received, I think, one, I will start with the question that was uh, posed by Jan. Uh, the question received, I think, some answers in the chat, but I would just encourage, again, all the participants, we will start with Jan's question, give the floor to Johan to answer. If there won't be any additional new questions related to Johan's presentation, I will give the voice also to the people who responded. Um, I will give the floor to the people who responded uh, to Jan's uh, question in the chat. So, just so... Um, we know how um, we can proceed. Okay, uh, Jan, or not Jan, yeah, Jan, Jan, are you with us? Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, okay, so uh, on slide seven and also on the slide where you compare, where you show the decreasing cost of renewables on both slides, for example, can you go back to slide seven? Is it that one? Yeah, but also this slide, yeah. I mean, these costs are per installed kil uh, cap capacity, right? If I understood correctly, which, is, which can be very different from the actual generating capacity in certain circumstances. So I think- uh, this, These are the costs per, per kilowatt hour. Yes, installed capacity. So for example, for wind, when generated. they're fully blowing, or is this average or the minimum? I think these are the median costs uh, these are the levelized cost of electricity, and I think these are the medians. I would have to look into the source again. Okay. So it's not the average, but it's the median. Okay, so even if these are the medium, uh, what I think is the problem is not the actual cost for installed or medium capacity, but what happens when, the, when they're at the low. For example, for offshore wind, when the wind is not blowing, for photovoltaic, when the sun is not shining. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, these are variable sure. renewables, no, no yeah. doubt, of course. On, for next 10 or 20 years in, Ger in countries like Germany or Slovenia, if we want to go fully CO2 free and we don't want to use natural gas, what do you see in these countries as a solution? Um, so the interesting thing is, I mean, th this, this argument, I mean, this is a serious argument and it always comes up. Um, the interesting thing is in, in, uh, in Germany, um, what, and, and that's one of the things that is pre pretty cheap to access is, is doing something on the demand side. And you start, usually firms start with large customers that can for minutes or for a couple of hours reduce their electricity demand and offer this and under the label of demand side management offer this as a balancing capacity on the demand side and what we saw in Germany that as the renewables were above certain threshold and as the market was opening so that these new kind of demand side services could come into the market um, they were competing and they were soon, many of them were soon coming out of business because it needed only a few um, to really balance the existing um, fluctuations in supply. 
And so saying, I mean, the bottom line is that within the existing system, there is a lot of capacity that can be through intelligent means and under the right, you know, market designs can be made available to balance variation in renewables on a short-term basis. I'm not talking about seasonal. For seasonal, we need something else. Um, but on a short-term basis, these can be well-balanced. And the problem with demand-side management services was that as long as we have um, a baseload power in the system, and especially baseload from nuclear, um, that these demand side services have difficult, um, I mean, cannot exploit their full potential, which is why it needed only a few firms um, to cover this market. And it was not as much potential as people thought there would be in the first place. So the, the bottom line is, even without investing into storage or building transmission to, I don't know, connect to hydropower from Norway. I mean, these, these are all the things that people are doing. And I mean, there are many different ways to provide storage and flexibility in the system. But one of the simplest is demand side management. It just needs markets where you can, you know, where you can offer these services and it just needs software that you can switch on and off certain, um, uh, certain consumers. And once this is in place, that already covers a lot of the, um, the sh short-term variation of renewables. Of course, for seasonal storage and for long-term storage and balance, there are other technologies needed. But the thing is what we, I mean, and that is one of, uh, that is one of the lessons, at least from Germany, when we have the, baseload power plants, they do not go well with variable renewables and demand side management because they somehow crowd out also crowd out also the business of demand side management as long as there is much baseload in the system. Thank you. Yeah, what, what I'm concerned about is that so far the only demand side strategy that was successful was moving the heavy industry into third world countries, which is what I'm afraid about also not very ecological. I mean, this is what you've seen in Germany, for example. Okay, well, you, can, you can reply to that and then we'll go to the next uh, yeah. Mark's questions. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, I think where industries are located and where firms offer uh, open new production facilities, I mean, this is a very complex decision and electricity or energy costs can play a role in these issues, but usually they are, I mean, just one of many, many different factors. And for example, I mean, Germany has very high electricity costs and there are still like Tesla is building this new factory uh, in the vicinity of Berlin. So of course, industry whether industry enters or leaves the country, there are a lot of factors at play and energy is by far not the only and also for many in industries by far not the most important one, I'd argue. Uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, I think we, every time we then probably uh, go back into this debate, renewables nuclear, I think we're I'm repeating myself, myself by always pointing us back to yesterday's presentation, but I will do that again. And I'm sad that we don't have uh, yesterday's presenters with us uh, today as well, because they can probably add because um, something to the discussion, because that was, um, let's say, the um, cornerstone of the presentation by Sven and by Dave. Uh, so um, I think Johan touched upon some of the things that were uh, iterated by Sven, uh, especially when it comes to, when we talk about storage, when it comes to um, sector coupling or something that we talked about yesterday, uh, how the storage capacity will kind of go hand in hand with that, like what is the prognosis, the trends that are leading us um, 
that uh, we are currently witnessing and what kind of outlook they're uh, giving us in terms of storage uh, combined with the renewables penetration, sector coupling, etc. So I would just point everybody perhaps back again, like just to add to the discussion currently when it comes to renewables, costs, capacity, storage, all of those things to take a look back at uh, yesterday's presentations. Um, and also because uh, just now uh, you use the expression variable oftentimes, I know that something that um, Sven emphasized yesterday was uh, sort of his a bit frustration, not with the term uh, a variable, but with the term intermittent when it comes to renewables. And he emphasized yesterday that uh, renewable energy is not intermittent. Uh, sunrise, sunset does not come as a surprise, I think was, were his words. Uh, so I would again say, take a look back at also what we discussed yesterday for some additional context to these questions that uh, are now being raised. Uh, before going, because uh, I don't see, I just see in the chat currently some comments related to Jan's question and now Johan's response. So if I if we don't receive any additional questions to Johan's presentation, I will just give also the space to Jan and Andre, and I think it was Matthias who um, contributed to the debate in the chat. Um, but before that, yeah, because um, I again presume that we'll end up um, perhaps spinning in these circles <laughs> around the uh, renewables and costs and all those things that I think that we've uh, come back to several times in the last two days. I would just like to add that uh, why we found uh, Johan's um, also research and contribution something very, very valuable is also because it looks at the, let's say, a, a broader picture when it comes to um, uh, how to make decisions on energy policies uh, today. And I think that simple guiding question when it comes, for example, uh, when it comes to nuclear, uh, it's, very, um, uh, it's very important. So, okay, we have this technology that, for example, in our country is being discussed in terms of new builds as something as a way to go for climate measures. And that guiding question, okay, what is happening with this technology? Is it in decline or not? Let's take a look at it from a technological innovation perspective. And that perspective from what I've heard from Jochen, it, you know, it goes a bit broader. It looks at uh, sort of the industrial base related to different technologies, what's happening there, different actors um, that are present in the political sphere, et cetera. So I would also encourage people if they have any questions um, that relate to this broader topic of sustainability transitions. Uh, to add their comments. Okay. I think there are two further comments from Andre and yeah. Phil. Yeah, uh, I, will I, say. Now, uh, I will go now first to uh, Jan Haverkamp, then we'll go to Andre, and then we'll go to Phil. And we also, Matthias, I think, just wrote like a line. So if Matthias would like to comment as well, please write in the chat. But let's go, Jan, Andre, Phil for now. Okay, Jan, you can add your uh, remark if you wish to the one that you've uh, contributed in the chat. Uh, Jan Haverkamp. Okay, um, very shortly. I mean, uh, the, the, I, I just agree with Jochen here. Um, grid stability is an issue that we've been working on already for 20 years. Um, that is an issue that is solvable. And um, we, we've had examples of a virtual system in Germany, which has been running over quite a few years, um, that was basically um, delivering on demand. Uh, and that was a virtual 100% renewable system within the grid. Um, and there's a lot of modeling being done already on, on a five minute basis. Um, that grid thing is, is, is basically solved and I've given a link to uh, a report from 2014 that uh, that shows that for the EU uh, for the EU level I'm very curious to hear uh, to hear the comments from Phil from Phil and uh, from Andre okay 
Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, Andre, uh, if you would like to make your uh, give your comment now. Well, thank you very and then, much. Uh, yeah. After all the comments, uh, or after Andre makes his comment, uh, we'll let Johan answer and then we'll go to Phil. Okay. Uh, the comment relates to Jan's question and Johan's presentation. Uh, the uh, cost of renewables uh, is uh, a bit misleading if we look at it at uh, uh, just face values. Because let's say with the wind power, uh, the availability factor is typically about 30% for offshore, it's less for uh, inland, and uh, the cost, uh, the availability for solar is of course even lower. Um, so um, let's say for offshore wind, you must, uh, um, uh, assuming that we sort the energy grid stability problem and energy storage problem for seasonal variations, that means you have to have a three times over capacity so that you can go to, let's say, 100% renewables. And very often that cost of over capacity or the required over capacity is not taken into account when you're comp comparing uh, the cost of uh, different sources of energy. I mean, availability factor of a nuclear is over 90%. And uh, for the best uh, offshore wind farms is roughly 30%. So that means a factor of three. Thank you. Yeah. Shall, shall I react to that? Yeah, Johan, you can react. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I fully agree that these are, I mean, you, you can distinguish between, you know, actual generation costs per kilowatt hour and the, if you will, the system costs. But nonetheless, I mean, and as I argued before, we have seen at least in some places that these system costs and the costs, especially for short term balancing can be quite low as well, that even firms went out of business because they could not just live on this, you know, balancing at in the current state of the market. So um, these, these costs have to be added, but the, the, the thing or the problem, especially for nuclear is, and of course we have other you know, we also have um, the, the possibility to build transmission to, you know, places where there's more hydro. Um, we have other ways to long-term, to do long-term storage. The, the thing is, the, the cost gap to nuclear is already so big. I personally cannot see that even if you add these system costs to the renewables, I mean, they're getting cheaper as we speak. So the thing is, you know, the costs of nuclear have stagnated or rather gone up, you know? And so you're, you're confronted with such kind of development that's, I, you know, that makes the entire discussion, you know, yeah, well, we can all discuss about the details and the system costs, but the big picture is pretty, at least in, 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 from my perspective, is pretty dismal for nuclear. Uh, thank you, Jochen. Uh, I will now invite Philip to add his comment. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Jochen, for a good presentation. Just two points before I make my substantive point to Jochen. It, do go and look at the latest Bayes, so the official government data from the British government shows that when you include integration and flexibility costs, renewables are still uh, considerably cheaper than new nuclear. And that's official government figures there. Uh, so that's worth a look. Um, and one other point, nuclear plants do often have to shut down and size well be in the UK does, and they're off for months. Uh, when they do. So every kind of generation is uh, in some ways uh, intermittent, you could say. So uh, Jochen, I think you've highlighted something that's very important for broadening the discussion on, on nuclear um, and the TIS perspective really is very valuable for doing this. Um, it is the case that when there was the great nuclear expansion in the 60s and 70s, um, 
you know, about 90% of R&D expenditures in main nuclear countries were being spent on nuclear, nothing else. I mean, it was, and this was state expenditure. It was huge, billions and billions of pounds. It seems that without that, there is an issue with sustaining the costs of things you highlighted, the, 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 the things like uh, the training and the skills and how do you pay the costs for the, the nuclear ex expertise to sustain this TIS. I'm just wondering in your research, because I rarely see these kind of costs factored into any discussion. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you came across sort of detailed information about how much money you really do need to <laughs> sustain a, a nuclear industry and all these skills and everything that goes along with it. Because I'd hazard a guess that there's costs associated with that that are considerably higher yeah. than with other industries. So, so I'm just curious about that. Yeah, we, we, tried, we tried to look into R&D budgets, public R&D budgets on nuclear, and we got these figures for a couple of countries. And then we, I mean, like for the US and also for some European countries where we're able to get these figures. And then you see exactly what you said. Like there were times when a lot of R&D went into nuclear, then later more R&D went into renewables. I mean, I mean, there is no doubt every innovation and also in energy, every innovation, especially in its early years, is heavily supported by public funding. Full stop. You know, this is what we do. You know, when we develop something new, we throw public R&D at it with the hope that some of the knowledge and industry that is created remains in the country where the R&D money is coming from. Um, Unfortunately, for nuclear, we were not able to get coherent data for R&D and also for long-term R&D um, at the global scale. That is, I mean, we didn't, I mean, later on when we finished the study, we found a database, but we did not exploit it in our study. But it would be cool to look into that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Johan. Uh, yeah, I was just now writing in the chat that, um, yeah, we have uh, a few minutes, uh, I mean, officially one, one minute, but uh, I'm sure like we can take five minutes if anybody has uh, more questions uh, for Johan or even for Philip who's still with us and related to their presentations. Because um, I know there's, <laughs> there's a debate in the chat, but it's mostly between uh, the same group of people. So if anybody else would like to contribute with a question, uh, please do so now. Because um, uh, I don't know when you'll have uh, the chance next to speak with our speakers or presenters. Um, okay. Uh, well, if there are no hands raised, I would then slowly Maybe, maybe I do one last remark. So sure. with, within our team, we had um, one person who was really in favor of nuclear. So in our small research team, right? We were, I mean, it was not a team of people that have always been skeptical about nuclear, but it was like more people that have been studied other technologies like me. And it's like, yeah, well, nuclear is also there, but there's not so much innovation going on. This is why I concentrated on other technologies. But we had one in our team who was like, yeah, well, really nuclear is, will be the solution to climate change. And for him, like really digging into all this data, into all this data, for him, it was in the end, he was, I mean, he still is very, I mean, he's still believing in nuclear. So he's still saying, yeah, we need to, you know, play all the cards we have to, to address climate change. But his views on nuclear changed as he, you know, looked, uh, as we all looked into what's really on the table. Just, you know, because many of these debates are also a bit ideological and people come with, okay, I really believe in something. And then this is, I mean, just saying, we also had it in our team and that was also interesting. Um, well, this is how people are, right? Okay, we, had, we have one last question that came in. Uh, again, Jochen, you can try. Uh, I will invite Borut uh, to um, uh, present a question. Uh, yes, and Jochen, you can perhaps try to answer it. Uh, 
again, I think it's also something that yesterday's speakers would, uh, would also be suitable, but uh, Borut, if you're with us. Yeah, we came around uh, that nuclear, uh, if we invest in nuclear, is all the money is going elsewhere. What about uh, development, innovation, and then production of uh, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, and batteries? Do we have strong development in Europe? Yes, for those very things? strong, very strong. It's, I mean, there are places like Germany where you get an increase. I mean, there are, you know, regions that have already seen a lot of onshore wind turbines. And, you know, when you have wind turbines at a high density, then you also get resistance. Um, but yes, I mean, the first answer is yes, you see a lot of development. You have a strong industry base um, for wind. Uh, the industry base for solar is mainly in China. So, um, solar panels are mostly imported and wind turbines are mostly produced or many of them are mostly produced within Europe and you have very strong markets in in most European countries even France is building a lot of wind and also solar and with batteries with batteries it's it's less mature I'd say um, there is, there are, I mean, there are all kinds of discussions. I mean, probably vehicle to grid batteries. That's that's still a way in the future. But there is the discussion of uh, second life of car batteries to put them into stationary. There are just uh, regular battery storage projects for for sh especially for short short term grid stabilization. But batteries is in a less mature state than solar and wind are. So wind and solar are very mature and are booming in, I think, most European countries. Yeah. Yeah, Katja, we don't hear you if you're talking. If you're talking to us. Yeah, okay. sorry, sorry. Uh, now this will be because I already see that some people will be leaving. So this is really the last question. Jan posed another question, Jan Malet, and this will be the last one because we don't like, so people are not just dropping off and we're, let's say five minutes or 10 minutes behind uh, late as it is. So Jan, uh, one, uh, the last questions that you pose and then Johan's response uh, and I'll wrap up. Yeah, I, I would also like to see, to hear the general statement and also from the presenter. Uh, how do you see the, the roles of the role of fusion in the future energy grid? Just this. Hmm. I, you know, I know little about fusion. It would be interested if it developed at some point or if it were, were running. I'm, you know, I personally would like to see if, running fusion reactor. I find it interesting. Um, I mean, whether we will see it, I mean, it's obviously very difficult to stabilize this plasma thing. And then, I mean, one thing is the technical thing. I, I mean, I personally think small, nu uh, small uh, nuclear is, is, is much more likely to be technically feasible than fusion, but I, I'm, you know, I'm by no means an expert. This is just my gut feeling. Um, but then again, if we were able to control fusion, that would probably cool. Would probably be cool. Thank you, Thank you Jürgen. Uh, I think Phil also raised his hand. So as he was also a speaker, and I think he has an, also a comment on to Jan's last question. I'll give also the last chance for Phil to answer this and then wrap it up. Uh, yeah, just quickly. I think uh, yeah, fusion is cool but it's not a solution in in the near term and we know that the old joke which is uh fusion is only uh 30 years away and they've been saying that for 70 years and uh, it continues to be the case that I, I think the fusion reactor has only produced more energy than it actually takes to to get it running for a few seconds so in terms of viability for climate mitigation in the near term rapidly it's it's not 
it's not a solution. And um, again, it's a lot of, it's about opportunity costs and it's about what you choose to spend your money on if there's a finite amount of money. And if the challenge really is rapid climate mitigation, then I don't necessarily see fusion as the way forward. And one final thing is that I think for all of us, it's important to reflect on what I find fascinating about nuclear is why we consider things like fusion and, and small modular reactors and fast breeder reactors that haven't, why are these considered as kind of realistic options? But what's actually happening with renewables in the past 10, 15 years and what's been modeled and so on is considered as technologically impossible. I'm always fascinated by how these assumptions are, are built in. And I think we should all think about that and, and question that because there is an incredible transformation underway uh, globally. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, I think uh, you stole part of my, uh, let's say, wrap up <laughs> message. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody, to all the uh, speakers, to all the participants who contributed not only with their presence, but with their questions and uh, comments. And so uh, you helped us make um, this digital event feel as interactive as possible. Um, and yeah, as Phil mentioned, we do have, we have um, or what Phil touched upon now in his last comment is looking at the increasing climate crisis, we do have a big task at hand and perhaps going back to the beginning of our um, first day yesterday. So if we are truly serious about um, climate uh, measures and uh, lowering our emissions in a timely manner, uh, we need to be, for example, phasing out coal in the next nine, 10 years, so by 2030. So maybe to wrap up is when we have this climate perspective um, ahead of us or in front of us and posing the question uh, in the Slovenian context is building a new nuclear reactor, uh, uh, let's say the most feasible and optimal climate solution uh, to go for. And if by, let's say, looking at the statements made by our political present, uh, representatives or um, uh, at the public debate present uh, to a large extent in uh, the media so far, we might think that the answer would be, a, yeah, it looks like the most reasonable option there is. And what we hope uh, that we managed to do in the last two days with uh, with inviting uh, these speakers to come and join us and um, opening up this debate is that uh, we added um, some arguments um, related to energy policies, related to climate measures uh, that when taken into account uh, should make uh, <laughs> this answer a bit different or should make also, uh, new nuclear builds seem like uh, not such a straightforward uh, solution as it now seems, to put it um, actually as, let's say, uh, mildly. Or, um, yeah, when we would, uh, if we have, um, from all the, the presentations that we have seen, um, taking into account the current energy trends um, taking place, uh, looking at cost competitiveness, of course, that we've talked a lot about, uh, looking at uh, capacity installations in the previous years, uh, and then also looking at, of course, all the other uh, options available when it comes to renewable energy. Um, also, I want to take us back to the presentation by Ben, um, when he emphasized the time frame, the construction times related to nuclear energy, the delays experienced uh, with current nuclear projects, um, and also the decommissioning issue um, that is ahead of us uh, and should uh, we should be paying a bit more attention to. So we really do hope that, yeah, we manage to add some layers to the current, let's say, discussion or non-discussion that was taking place in Slovenia and that was, we felt was kind of blindly leading us into um, seeing new nuclear builds as sort of almost the only um, um, uh, climate solution there is and uh, 
hopefully uh, based on these two days we see that the answer is very much can be different and it's not uh, as straightforward as it is uh, let's say presented or seen today um, yeah so maybe on that note I will be uh, ending uh, this today event uh, we will be sharing all the today's presentations with you in an email. The recordings were also <coughs> available afterwards. Uh, and we, we will be sharing them uh, once they're uploaded on YouTube. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for being here. And yeah, uh, till next time, I guess. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Katja. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks, everybody. Discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good nice to talk work. to you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.